good afternoon and good morning to the Laughing Monkey Music Show. We're going to do a, a countdown of some of our favorite horror songs, soundtracks. We never really officially decided. it. I think we're just doing soundtracks, right? Because that's why I, I did it. Yeah, so, I think we're just, you know, we're both like crazy into movies. And, we, we are, and I don't usually do a movie yeah. thing, but there's always music themed. And then this is... Yeah, so I cut, because we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, and it's a shame we didn't have it for Halloween. And so I was about to pull up my notes on here because I'd already done like a top five, which was quite difficult. But then I realized in, in my notes, I'd made some honorable mentions. So those honorable mentions have gone into my top 10, right? Good. However, like I just, over the years, things have, things have kind of changed for me because musically, um, you know, and it's just you get older, you like different things and stuff like right. that. And I, I thought, you know, there's all these old horror movies, these B movies that I used to watch and stuff. But, you know, I'm not sure they they uh, resonate with me kind of like they used to, you know, because I'm a different person now, you know, I'm, I'm older and stuff like that. So I'm going to start off by we're going to go from 10 to 1, right? Yeah. So we're going to we're not going to waffle too much, hopefully. Well, I'll try no, no, and I'll quantify my view on on. I had old ones and two. That was my thing because I I dig like the soundtracks of the, especially the old European French vampire movies. They're really just crazy. But then I love some of the soundtracks from the eighties with the, the 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 keyboard or the punk music influence. And I'm like, how am I going to do this? Am I just going to do one thing? I did a mixture of them all. That's well, that's good. And I I had a feeling you might go down that route, and which is why I think I've gone the other way. I, and then I was thinking, no, we're we might choose the same things here. I was but I've, got, I've got a feeling. I've got a feeling you're going to go because what I did originally, my original list was quite underground, and there's a few <laughs> little underground things in here. But then I've gone back the other way, and I'll explain why. But anyway, so number ten, yeah. right? My in my top ten of kind of horror movies. Now I, I don't know really if you can class it as a horror movie. So I've been quite broad. So the first one is uh, 28 Days Later, right? Um, and the, the composer was John Murphy. It's that really haunting piece of guitar music throughout 28 Days Later, which is kind of a horror movie, like vampire. Well, I agree. Yeah, space movies, movie. horror movies, anything kind of suspenseful is yeah. there. And, and I already knew like him from other movies, you know, I'd already heard his stuff. And then, of course, I went to see Sunshine, which is kind of like a sci-fi, little bit right. horror-y. So bit number thriller. 10, I actually did, I did uh, it was a tie. It's the only one I did as a tie. Everything else is single. I did the soundtrack for The Nightmare on Elm Street, the first one. Tied it with, with Twin Peaks. Okay. Very good choice. Very now, good choice. Nightmare. See, that did cross my mind. But again, I was thinking horror. Can you put Twin Peaks into horror again? Yeah, I guess you can. Are you? It's like space is scary or the ocean scary. I had on here and I took it off with Jaws because that's a horror film. Yeah, see, I had that as well, right? And I removed it because, yeah, of the same reason. It is a horror movie, so well, I think we're on the I think we're on the same page here. I think we're on the same page. So these are all notables because if you go back and you have to listen to Jaws, and you know, I went back and listened because it's been so many years since I've actually heard the true music in because you didn't hear it in, a, in a movie theater, but to hear the the strings and the dun 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 in headphones like the old way the original because we've heard so many versions of it it's been watered down but to hear the yeah. original it's heavy well, so you mentioned nightmare on elm street number yeah. nine i've got nightmare on elm street five. Oh, you're right okay so nightmare on elm street five was bring your daughter to the slaughter no uh, good call bruce dickinson right so the only reason i remember this at the time when it came out i had a girlfriend and she was a massive iron maiden fan Mm -hmm. And I'd loved Iron Maiden for years, obviously. So I was chuffed to have a girlfriend that was into the same thing. And her brother was a big metalhead as well. And, and she bought it on single, 45. And, and I was like, amazing, you know. And so apparently it was written for, originally it was written for Bruce Dickinson's solo project. Mm -hmm. And it ended up somehow just becoming part of um, the album. I the know. Omen. Yeah, for sure. That I mean, is absolutely creepiest. terrifying creepiest um, the whole thing all the orchestration is just and like with most music it's the space in between it's just the sounds it's just uh it's it's horrible and you know what going like when i was trying to remember like these old movies i would stumble on stuff on youtube that i used to watch when i was a kid and it gave me anxiety just to hit click you know because it 
it takes you back to, you know, you're eight years old or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, you have that anxiety, it stays with you. It's like, you know, it's yeah. into your DNA. Good. All right, number eight, I'm you've probably got this on your list already. Yep. Um, Mike Oldfield, Tubular Bells, obviously from The Exorcist. No, it was, it was going to be, but I didn't. I had to thin some stuff out. Yeah, so, you know. Good. But that's one of those, again, I think it wasn't written for The Exorcist. It was Mike Oldfield, who was pretty unknown. And I read Richard Branson's uh, book from how he set up Virgin. And he was one of the first artists, if not the first artist, to be signed to Virgin. And, um, and you know, it got picked up, this this track you know from tubular bows got picked up yeah. and used in the movie and he was a very reclusive kind of character and i think richard branson um he was putting on like a big gig for virgin records back in the day and michael field just he didn't want to go <laughs> he was headlining and he didn't want to go and i think richard branson gave him his rolls royce he said you know he took him for a drive in the rolls royce he says can't i just pick you up for a drive we'll go out for a drive and he said, look, if you do the gig, I'll give you this Rolls Royce. You can have it. So he went, yeah, all right then. And I, th I think it was just anxiety that he didn't want to do the gig. Um, and I'm not surprised writing music like that. But anyway, go. What's your number eight? That's good. One thing else is a nod back. I think some of these great opera opera type style music are always a nod back to the as I was early, the old French or European films, like the vampire ones and the old, old, the old horror films of the 60s. Some of the guitar and the music is so scary in those. And I think that's really just a nod back to those. Like, they must be going back and going, what can I write? And go back And some of these guys, not him, but in general, because it's just, that's the scary music. Um, so anyway, back my, my, my eight is um, Dracula 2000. <laughs> yeah. Is that it, the Bram Stoker's? Bram Stoker's no, one? That's, no, you're getting ahead of me. That's on my yeah. list. But this is the one that has, it was all like the metal bands and it has like a time print of that time. It's got like, Okay. and terror on it void the light which is such a great uh, song yeah yeah yeah, yeah i remember i remember yeah it's, yeah it's not, um just a bunch of other bands on that were kind of like between that new metalish time and i have mixed emotions about the time but like i think um some of the bands on there were just fantastic you know and it's a solid solid metal horror film and it needs to get recognized because it's which they, they just they just like just come hand in hand right? right metal and horror i think that's probably you know when i was a kid and i used to see these iron maiden t-shirts like to me they were horror on a mm -hmm. t-shirt and i was like what is that it was mysterious you know but, but people would embrace it like you know and i was like what what is that's this the last one you know? i don't think there's been one like that's the other thing is i think it was like the last big metal album that was tied to a horror film that i know of on a big level it's got like to come back. Album. It's got to come back. I mean, there could be other bands. That are like a horror movie. There's some weird rock bands out there, like weird type of alternative that may be on them. But I'm saying Pantera level where you're just gross. Just, you know what I mean? It's not a mixture. Um, yeah. Well, what do you got? So you're in seven, right? Uh, no, that was your, what was that? Your eight? Was that your eight? Okay. You can't so my... the music. We're not the numbers. Yeah. We're not mathematicians. I've got, my, I've got my little list on my phone. So I'm just right. checking. I can keep track of where I am, where I'm at anyway. So number seven, which, you know, some of my best friends will agree with me on this one, but they will probably disagree that it should be at number seven. It should be a lot closer to number one is uh, The Thing by John Carpenter. And that obviously John Carpenter, you know, he wrote a lot of his soundtracks yeah. and uh, you know, he had a room full of synths and dung dung. It's but just that dung dung. I had it on my list. There you go, right? There you go. And it's it's one of those things where the movie is so slow and it gave me nightmares as a kid, you know, and um, vivid, vivid nightmares. I remember uh, the scene with the dog, you know, and we had but a dog. Really, but the build up on it, it really, if you could tear it back, it could be like a Seinfeld episode about nothing because there's such a few. The concept is so sparse to that movie, but it's yeah. so horrifying. But it's really, it's, uh, you know, it's right up my street, yeah, those kind of movies. Hard to yeah. find, figure it out. Like, you're not just going and opening up the box or figure, open the door. Like, it's literally just dragged out. But it's scary doing it. But it's really a, a small plot. And, yes, it's scary as hell being dragged out. And then when it actually kicks off, it's horrendous. Right. Like, the, the horror is like nothing you'd ever seen and it was just like, oh my God, you know. I think the characters and the scariness of the space of being out in the middle of nowhere 
and knowing that no one's going to know about it, which is scary. Well, they created that, didn't they? It was very clever to put them in the North Pole or wherever they were, you know. And it, that was it's very. And the fact it can travel again because no one's going to know again, just like in spaceships, they get attacked. You just don't know where it's going to go again. Yeah. And do you, can you believe they actually remade that? And I watched the remake, and I was like, yeah. I didn't, and I'm not against the idea of if you can. Some movies could be they were done poorly. It was a good concept, could be remade. You know, like The Hobbit. The Hobbit was a cartoon. They did a good job remaking it over the cartoon. Some things you can do a better version of. The thing was just too good to be, you know. Thing, it you can't, you can't, it's like Point Break. You can't remake Point Break. No. no. Like, what? <laughs> Shut up. For all its cheese, it's right. so great. I don't care, you know. It is, it is actually, remake it's that. It's Patrick Swayze point. jumping out of a plane himself. He was a massive skydiver. Like, hello. Like, you know, whatever. No one did that stuff back then. <laughs> And the looks on his face when he does those sidekicks and kicks somebody is my heart. It is. Um, all right. So my number seven. Now this is Bram Stoker's Dracula soundtrack one. Okay. Which, so that, yeah, this, this is the, this is the, who's the director? Francis Ford Coppola, right? Oh, Francis now, Ford Coppola. This is one that I think a remake was good. I like the remake on this one um, that he did because I like, he did like, he remade it with like mirrors and smoke and mirrors. Literally he didn't do technology. He remade it old fashioned. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. the actors were pretty good. I think it was done well. The soundtrack is just even spot on better, as far as I'm concerned. It's a good, moody soundtrack. Well, you know, you know I, I don't know if you've like read the book or anything, but yes. like, of course, and it's it's so close. It's so close to the book, even the way mm -hmm. the book is narrated through a diary and stuff like that. It's great. So I loved it. I loved everything about it. Yeah. Um, it has dated now a little bit. You go back and look at it as dated, but I think it's still good. It shows Which is good about you, it, what, what was happening in cinema at the time. And, you know, like people like Tarantino, they were always trying to, you know, avoid the technology at the time. And, and you know, this is actually a favorite song of mine. And it's something that's followed me ever since I saw the movie. It's, this song has followed me. I don't know why I've not done a tutorial on it. I, I guess it's because it's a little bit abstract. But um, so I've gone, uh, it's called After Dark by Tito and Tarantula from the movie <sighs> Gusto Dawn. You have to do it. You know, I have to do it, right? It's that dum brun ka dum ka dum ka dum And I always remember it. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, viewers, I have that. I have it's a the scene where Samuel Hayat comes out with a snake on her and, you know, she was terrified of snakes. Tarantino's like, you got to do it with the snake. She's like, I hate snakes. He was like, well, Madonna said she was going to come and do it. So she was like, give me the snake. So my number six, do you remember the Black Roses the soundtrack? Of the Black Roses in the 80s, they were a made up rock band that came into town and they possessed everybody. The singer went by the name of Avon. The music, the musicians in the band were like King Cobra. Um, just looking at Lizzie up Borden. Now. Lizzie Borden does it, did the song Me Against the World. Um, a bunch of different like rock metal bands right and they they're a pretend rock band and it's it's a good it's a good soundtrack and they come in town they get possessed and they all turn into monsters like reptile monsters a lesson on halloween which was uh the lost boys gerard um mcmahon yeah. cry little sister right from the lost boys okay? i enjoyed it and that's why i didn't do that song because i figured you were going to do it i had i was going to do, the lost boys was on my uh, top 20 you've yeah. already picked three other ones on my top 20 i had to i it had to go in there it had to no, go had in to. there right but at the same time when i did that tutorial people are messaging me saying what about uh tim capello's i still believe right I still believe, which is great, which is a great, great tune. And it just yeah. reminds me of the 80s all over. It reminds me of being a teenager. Um, so I had to put them at, at double double slot at number five of the Lost Boys soundtrack. And, and you know, you, you've even got, I don't think it was the original Doors, but you've got People Are Strange. And, and I always, when I think People Are Strange, even though it wasn't the Doors on the Lost Boys soundtrack, it was the cover of. So I always think... I actually hear the Doors and I do it. I pretend it's not them. I pretend it's the Doors, actually. Exactly. Me too. I have no idea who it is. I'm really sorry, whoever whoever did it, the cover. But it's just a cover, right? So you can't really... I believe it is. And I think because there's certain things, like you can, like there's certain artists, you hear their voices when they do the joke, like, like a Morgan Freeman. Like, there's a bunch of artists, but there's more of them now that do the voice. And um, when I hear the Doors, I just think of the Doors. So. Exactly. Exactly. There's no way. So, and actually, um, number five, I did is I did Return of the Living Dead. Oh, of course, you want a party? I just watched this about three weeks ago, and it so 
hilarious. Like, it's so funny. Like, it's so stupid funny. I was laughing so much. I'm like, I can't believe how funny it's so good. The sound of anyway, the big song was uh, from 45 Grave. Do you want to party? And that was a revamped version by them. Like what TSOL's on there, and um, I think the Cramps are on there. It's yeah, nice again, it's one of those out. classic soundtracks where certain bands were 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 plucked, like you were. Forty five Grave was that was the big standout part of it to me. That song still sticks out, and I think of the movie. Yeah, for um, sure. So that's just my pick for for five. I like it, and it's a it's a classic movie as well. So. I guess I mixed it up. I had to mix these up. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So, um, number four, um, you know, a bizarre collaboration of uh, Ozzy Osbourne and and Lemmy from Motorhead. I and mean, Zach Wild, I think, played guitar on this as well, which was Hellraiser yep. um, for the Hellraiser three movie. And I remember where I was living at the time, and I used to go to the Blockbuster. You know the video rental place, oh, I know. and, uh, and I, th I think I'm sure we still renting videos, and I'm, I don't even think we were onto DVDs, even though they were, maybe they were around. I don't know, um, but that was like, yeah, my girlfriend at the time, she was like, "How is the threes out? We need to, we need to see it." And and uh, you know, and Ozzy and Lemmy are on the soundtrack, and so it was like, okay, and it just took me back to a place. I must have been about seventeen. Number for track four. Now the, the movie was so cheesy, but the soundtrack had some great stuff. Shocker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. one? Absolutely. It had some, it had like, you know, Megadeth, No One Was Nice Guy. It's a full on rock song, soundtrack. It's a good soundtrack. I think, yeah. um, was it the Dudes of Wrath or something? It was a make believe rock band they put together that did the soundtrack was like, uh, it was like Paul Stanley and Desmond Child co sang vocals together and had like a whole bunch of the rockers on, on it to do other songs on soundtrack. Yeah. It's a fun soundtrack. So that's my number four. The movie was probably one of the worst movies ever. The, well that's well that's the thing when i was going through this stuff it's like but there's you know so many sometimes so many good soundtracks the movies would like right. yeah. so yeah. my number three it, i don't know if you've seen this movie hopefully you have it's a movie called hardware it was introduced to me yeah. by my old singer in a band from when i was about 16 years old and uh, public image limited did a track on there called this is what you want and it's like a sample. This is what you want. This is what you get. This is what you want. This is what you get. And it's just wicked. And I still love it today. And I've seen Pill many times. And um, I'm, I'm a fan of the Pistols and stuff as well. And I love the film. And the film has actually got tons of good music on. Fields of Nephilim, uh, Motorhead's on there. Uh, wow. Iggy Pop features in it as well. Um, you know, if you haven't seen the movie, I know you probably have, but if our viewers haven't seen the movie, time. go I saw watch the movie. Yeah. I saw it once. That one I'll have to go back and see again because it's been a long time. And I don't even remember the soundtrack. That's yeah, just... soundtrack's wicked. So you go back and go, oh my God, this is great. It's also yeah. my last musical, like rock band one. But Trick or Treat. <laughs> okay, yeah. With um, Fastway, pretty much did the most of the soundtrack of it anyhow. And the, the, the lead um, evil guy was Sammy Kerr. was the evil guy. Gene Simmons was in it. I think right. Yeah, uh, Ozzy was Ozzy was in it. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, Ozzy was definitely in it. I don't know if Gene Simmons had a, a bit part of it too, or that oh, was another movie. Forgot all about that movie. Ozzy was a preacher. I know that on TV. He was a preacher, but that was and I had um, remember Skippy from um, uh, the Michael J. Fox show, Family Ties. Skippy, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the other nerd on Skippy was the metalhead nerd in this show in the movie. They got possessed by. The band or by the artist Sammy Kerr and Trick or Treat. Yeah, sorry, I'm just I'm just I'm just on Google right now going, oh yeah, God, I completely there's some great totally songs remember. on that album. Yeah. I mean that Trick or Treat is a really just it's like a fast way album to me. And it's so good. That's I you know, that I still listen to this day. I like it. And that's my last rock ones too. The last two are more soundtracky. So Okay, so we're we're down to um last two. Last two. So my number two had a probably yeah at the time i was deep deep into like um you know getting my band off the ground and and mm -hmm. uh, my entire wardrobe was just black <laughs> as it, um, um, I, th I think 80 percent of my wardrobe's black now but back then it was you know 99.999 no it's 100 percent black let's be honest here there's a there's a, probably the white and justice for all t-shirt um that i bought from my mate uh, and that was it so you know when the film the crow come out and you know 
the cure had agreed to you know write a, a song uh, burn for the for the movie you know it was just like wow and my girlfriend at the time was into the cure i didn't much like them i know who they were and you know i liked some of their stuff but they weren't dark enough and then i heard this and i was like oh my god you know that's like that changed everything and then i started listening carefully because apparently they wrote that song in like an hour or something robert smith was going through a transition with band members and he wrote it in like an hour i don't think they've ever performed it live um and not only that you know it was um dead souls a cover a joy division cover yeah. obviously nine inch nails so i had to i couldn't decide which one to have you know so that it's kind of a tiered one sorry i'm cheating again so the crow soundtrack again you talked about pantera earlier being on the tra soundtrack pantera on the soundtrack helmet so you know you were you were interviewing our good friend Paige, um, yep. amazing, massive influence um, on me growing up. Um, certainly in that genre, I would say Palmer. A lot of people might not agree with me here, but they were really fresh, and I don't think you know they weren't new metal, but they were certainly they had a new sound. And you know they're followed up by bands like Deftones, and then you, you, you well, I agree. Uh, and you, you thought you so. Know. You saw my struggle not trying to categorize it, but I didn't know like where to go with the the type of music to describe to somebody. Like you said, hey, on the street, have you heard Helmet? Like, no. What are they like? You're like, oh, they're not new metal. Yeah, like, also... and, and a lot of people didn't like them. They were very, they were very much in their own, in their own genre, you know. And I think you know they still are. I mean. I love the first couple of albums, obviously. But if you I'm listen old. to them on like a, on a crappy car stereo or something, right? It sounds very simple. But as you learn, like, you know, deeper in the interview, he's such a complex writer. There's so you go deep into it. It's not an easy song. It's not easy. Like well, it's not like. But when you first hear it, you hear that. Dun, 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 dun. It sounds very just like trotting along stoner metal, like where it's just big chords. But there's so much more to, to do it when you really listen to it, especially on a better stereo. Well, for me, learning that stuff was very difficult. And I was probably, Helmet's probably my first introduction to jazz because on Betty, you had these little stabs of jazz and it would just formulate into chaos. And I'd be like, what's that beautiful chord he's playing at the beginning? I just couldn't, and then it would just go, bang, and it would just go crazy. And because of like Paige, you know, with his drop tuning and stuff like that, I, I wrote a track called Zero. Um, and it's probably one of it's an instrumental track I wrote with uh, my old band Jet from the Sun, and and it was just like it was so erratic I couldn't put any lyrics to it and it's it's quite proggy, but the foundations of the ideas they're almost detuned jazz chords and they they sound really um, what's the word it's they're not so they're not diminished but they they just sound like off. You know, like a dissonance but, to it or something? Like yeah, yeah, totally dissonant, totally dissonant, but in the same way melodic, you know. So, and that was that all come from Helmet, you know. My, um, and the guy, my bandmates would just be like, "What is that?" You know, but they would they would trust me and roll with it and and understand it was about the energy, you know. It wasn't so much about the melody. But did you catch it was jazz when you first heard it? I don't think people understood. They're like, it's different metal. It, but like no one really heard the jazz, and it took a long time. You had to do the more advanced in your. But I'm yeah, always attracted to bands like that anyway, you know. No, but did you hear the jazz in it from the beginning? Like, like Tool and, and Nine Inch Nails. So, yeah, say again, sorry. Did you hear the jazz influence right from the beginning? Um, yeah, totally, yeah. Not Maybe not so much in the meantime, the first record. Right, right. Um, it was more Betty for me. Yeah, Betty, but then there was, there was you know, and I think Rick Rubin produced Betty as well. So I, I was listening hard to a lot of different stuff then, and you could really hear the guitars. You could really hear how they were tuned. You could hear what was going on, you know. So, but anyway, we're we're digressing here, my friend. That's what it's about. People, are, I want people to get all excited, me like writing down stuff, man. <laughs> you know, I know I'll be listening and watching some things now from our list. That's what I get out of it. You know, to me, it's just us talking. So number two is a soundtrack from one of the one of the one of my top five movies is um horror is The Shining. I almost a, put this in. I that almost is a put this in. That's a good soundtrack. The whole because thing. even the beginning, you know, the whole Blade Runner scene. You know the story about it being in Blade Runner. That's where they, you know, the director's cut. That 
So you're flying across the trees. You just dread. It's just such a fantastic film. I think um, Stephen King hated the movie because Kubrick changed it so much. Right. Um, but that was Kubrick saying, I'm going to do my thing. You know, he, he was a bit like that, wasn't he, number Kubrick? One. My number one, yeah, I've gone like a bit left field with this American Whale from London. Mm -hmm. And the, when you're a kid and you're watching that stuff, I don't know, it had such a huge impact on me. But then like you get go from this gruesome darkness, but then you, you get Credence Clearwater Revival, da, 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 major, major core change, major. And it's just like, what I see, bad moon rising. And like, it's that's been in my life for so many years. It was like horror irony. You know? Yeah, absolutely. It was comedy. It was John Landis saying that we're having a laugh here. Do you know what I mean? It's just all, it's all a bit of a joke. But as a kid, it was like relief from the terror. And I didn't really understand it until I got older. And, and now it's something that's, like I said, it's followed me for, I've played it for years in gigs, you know, with, with bands and done videos on it. And I still play it now. It's like one of these three, four chord wonders, um, um, you know, change the lyrics at the end. There's a bathroom on the right, you know, uh, all the rest of it. <laughs> and yeah, it's just one of those songs that I've fallen in love with for whatever reason that, you know, it was from a movie that absolutely ter terrified me and, and has formed. How old were you me. when you saw it? I saw oh my it God, I was way too young, dude. I was yeah, way too I young. I was my... probably about seven years old, seven or eight. Mm. Yeah, I must be about seven years old. Was. That's why. You see yeah. it that young? It's scary. Because you know. I think back then it was when John Landis released, it was Michael Jackson's Thriller. Mm -hmm. And that was friggin' terrifying enough. But, um, you know, then I'd heard that John Landis, you know, because there was always the making at the end of the, the movies or whatever, like when you used to get the VHSs, you'd always have the making at the end. It's like, yeah, yeah great. And it kind of took the terror out of it for me, you know. And then, of course, they talked about American Wealth in London. And, you know, my grandfather, like, maybe had it on VHS and it was written in Biro, American Wealth in London. I remember watching it and just the first five minutes like oh my god you know anyway without further ado what is your number one well all we picked out was just such a mismatch and i think you stay on track what i expected and that being your scariest one out of all the different types that still when you're the one that scared you even though the music was good this is the one that scared me and still the idea is still creepy to me because it feels like it's reality based the first one and the other ones had okay soundtracks too because this soundtrack if you go back and listen to it now you're gonna have to when we get off this it's almost industrial sounding it's like 20 minutes long or whatever. And it's still creepy. The original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh, my God. I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say that. That I had that on tape. I watched. That was always my scariest thing to watch. And the music is horrifying. Like, it's, it's creepy. It's like it's like with The Walking Dead and the beginning of The Walking Dead music of the, uh, the show. Always tries yeah, to yeah, capture. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just or ambience. Yeah. Massive sounds and monster sounds. That's like 74. This the soundtrack came out. There was no really industrial sound. We're talking a horror film with like a crazy soundtrack. It's not a playable soundtrack. It was, it was despicable. I think really for me, it was it was something that you know I started watching, and because even the way it was shot and and you know and you're watching it on VHS and it's such bad quality and. And you, you get the, the tape chewing sort of sound. It's just this dread. And, and, and I used to be like, why am I watching this? But it was so beyond horror. It was almost, it was, I've, even thinking about it now, it used to make me feel physically sick. You know, it was twisted. It made twist, funny days scary. <laughs> yeah. And it was just like, and that's, I think that and deliverance that, you know, I wanted, always wanted to live in, in America when I was a kid, but then I saw that in Deliverance, and I was like, yeah, I'm not so sure. Yeah, everyone would be scared about guns and stuff, about, you know, because in the UK yeah. we don't have that, right? Everyone would be like, don't move to America, there's too many guns, you'll get shot. And I was like, I didn't care about that, right? But I cared about, like, the crazies, you know? You don't get crazies anywhere like you do in the US. And, well, that's in the cinema anyway. Of course, you, of course you do of course you do but right. um, the world's changed now everyone's just crazy everywhere we found out <laughs> yeah but 
God, yeah. but that movie, there is something about this that's so gross. Like the old man is licking his lips, like the dryness, which is a close-ups. It had the, it felt almost gorilla shot in some level. It feels like what Blair Witch was trying to do. It feels like it's the original yeah. a lot. It felt awkward. I mean, it felt like something you shouldn't see. It felt like you're yeah, watching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just like, wrong. it was so wrong. It, it was immorally wrong. It wasn't mm -hmm. like, oh, we're going to create a monster and they're going to bite someone's head off. We're going we're gonna to create something even worse. We're going to create human beings that are so twisted you're going to be terrified. And, and of course, you know, and my mother always used to say to me, you know, you don't worry about the dead. The dead won't hurt you. It's the living you got to be worried about, you know, and it's absolutely true in that case, isn't it? <laughs> Excuse me, I run out of, um, I run out of gas. Could I use oh. your phone? Yeah, yeah right. Sure, come in. <laughs> you know, ah, oh. it's just horrible. There was the they picked they pick up somebody uh, some hippies in the road and then they picked him up and then like right in the back of the van he's like just cut himself and freaking out like right then and there, it just gets bad yeah. at the very beginning. It's just a hot summer day and it's just it feels like a bunch of, uh Yeah, I mean, it's, I remember that the the hammer scene, even the hammer and just seeing the body. I was watching that as a kid. I was just like, no man, this is messed up. I know, I knew that. I knew it was far worse than anything I'd seen. And I think that's probably why I've only seen it once because it's not something I'm like attracted to. Like, you know, but you feel bad for watching. You feel oh, actually morally bad. If you don't like it, but it's, but it's one of the things that really scares you and makes you really feel that. Uh. Yeah. It's because it, I guess because like there are some people like that in reality and that's mm -hmm. terrifying. Okay, dude, until next time.